focused on sort of, I guess, non-canonical sort of cytoskeletal stuff, right? So biology has this great history of like using model organisms, but uh, you know, it takes a special person to break away from that. And Alex is one of those people. And I think like one of the just fascinating things is that when you start doing this, you uncover all these new things that helps you re-understand in maybe a stronger way how life and biology works. Um, so, you know, today he's going to talk about some some aspects of the cytoskeleton and in archaea probably. But uh, yeah, I think so. <laughs> all right. Thank you, so, John. Alex will tell you more details about that. <laughs> all right. Okay. So uh, should I just share my screen here, right? Yes. Okay. Let's start here. All right. Um, so thank you, everyone. Thank you, John, for, for the invitation. Um, today, I'm going to talk about something that is kind of a result of many, many years of training and projects and different collaborations. Uh, most of the data I'm showing here is, quite, is still quite preliminary. And I, this, this, the actual data, I started working at the end of my postdoc. And I've been working myself in my lab now as a, you know, as a uh, continuation of my postdoc. Um, like John said, um, my formal training is all in bacterial cytoskeleton biology. However, now I'm transitioned to something a little bit weirder, that is archaeal cell, uh, cell biology and archaeal cytoskeleton biology. And I'm going to talk a little bit more why and how I'm going to work with that. So in the, oops, here we go. So if you guys have been following the MRSAC seminars, you've been hearing a lot about eukaryotic cytoskeleton. And we had Shashank and we had a Peter from MIT. We had a lot of great people talking why, you know, eukaryotic cytoskeleton is so important for cells for many different reasons. You have locomotion here on right. You have like cells moving from one side to other. And you see this fibronectin trails, meaning that the cell not only knows where they want to go, and they also leave a trail where they've been. And there are multiple, and it's not only fibronectin or actin or microtubules, there are a number of different families of eukaryotic, uh, eukaryotic cytoskeleton that have been studied over 100 years. So if you could say, you know, cell biology is almost a, a synonym of like cytoskeleton biology, not because cytoskeleton is necessarily more important than many other molecular machineries, but the fact is that historically we've been studying cytoskeleton for uh, long time. So cytoskeleton is very important and eukaryotic cytoskeleton has been studying for a long time. However, it's not been long since we identify it and as a community agreed that bacteria also have cytoskeleton. Uh, the first, you know, uh, evidence started in the mid 60s, 70s and 80s. However, they were all genetic and very interact. And in mid 90s, you have more biochemical and uh, structural bio biology, you know, uh, data to show that actually bacteria have, you know, tubulin, they have actin, they have all sort of different uh, typical uh, eukaryotic cytoskeletal elements. However, the more we study the bacterial cytoskeleton, the more we understand that they are not quite the same thing. Here's just one example, the tubulin, uh, the alpha tubulin that together with beta tubulin associates into in microtubules that is tens of micron like tubular structures, um, large. And while the bacterial tubulin that is, is made of one sole protein that is called F, that's Z, then is in, uh, primarily physiologically only assembles into like, you know, 1D or 2D protofilaments. And they are short, they are diffraction limiting short. So they're 100, 200 ish nanometer long. Um, so that kind of makes sense when you think that bacterial cells look like a little bit simpler, a lot simpler than eukaryotic cells, and they're way smaller. So it makes sense that you have smaller um, uh, polymeric structures inside of them. However, when we, in the mid 
2000s and 2010s, we started to advance microscopy and live cell imaging. We started to pay more attention to these little guys, you know, function and dynamics. And what we noticed that they are not only smaller, they, they are quite mobile and they can be in multiple places in the cell relative to the cell and they perform multiple functions from cell division to DNA segregation. And lately we've been learning a lot about virotic and, and this is kind of in context of COVID and everything. We are starting to learn that bacterial viruses, they inject uh, uh, when they integrate their genes into the host genome and start to produce protein, virotic proteins. They also produce these microtubule-like polymers that help to organize the host, the nucleoid and DNA in a position that is favorable for the, for the, for the virus. Uh, this is quite very interesting. There's a lot of biology behind all that. But what I've been learning uh, is that... What, yeah, sure. what kind of virus does that? Like, what is an example? Do the standard bacteriophages do it? Um, there are a few examples. This is not an exception. There are many bacteriophages that do that. Uh, the, the best reporter one is a phage for a, a Vibrio bacterium. So they have a lot of cryam, you know, inspection. They have, they have, they, they, they describe a lot, but this is not a normal. That's very easy to find these uh -huh. tubuling like gene in virotic ensembles. So the reason why they need to do that is unknown. They just know that they do actively organize the position, the temporal, spatial temporal, you know, uh, regulation of the host nucleoid, the DNA, the chromosome. So for some reason, this is very important for the infection progression. Uh, so after uh, a couple of decades of, of studies of this prokaryotic or bacterial cytoskeleton, uh, they, under, they, they try even to rename them instead of cytoskeleton to cytomotive elements because uh, biophysically they don't confer a lot of mechanical, mechanical resistance or they don't generate force a lot. They are kind of floppy, very flexible, tiny filaments, but they are very capable of moving around and distribute cargo around the cell or localize cargo in certain, certain parts of the cell. So. And then when you look also to just to represent what I've been saying about size and dimensions, you have here a progression from, um, you have bacillus, uh, let me see if I can, oops, if I can, mouse control. Oops. I don't know how to point out here, but, well, I'm gonna have to, does someone know how to, to create a uh, laser point here. You can use a mouse, uh, Alex. Uh, it's not showing up, but that's okay. Here we go. So if you see here, you're gonna have a number of different species and in green, you're gonna have actins and in purple, you're gonna have DNA uh, label. Uh, and among all these different species, you see that most of them are eukaryotic, but here in the top left, you're gonna see a bacterium bacillus in which I worked for some, quite some time. And you have some acting patches, tiny, tiny patches distributed uh, uh, across this, the, the cell membrane. So the question that I had uh, for, a, for, a, for some time is that how, when you see all this diversity of sizes and shapes and functions, how actually like the, the cytoskeleton the filaments and polymers evolve it from tiny and flexible and floppy to large and robust and, and, and with a number of new features that we study in eukaryotic cells. So the thing that we learn in, in Evolution 101 is that this requires a series of mutations and selections. And, and, and so at some point, the tiny uh, will be, became the large one. However, it's way more complicated than that. Um, actually, uh, by, by evidence, we know that the evolution of these systems or any mach molecular machineries, they rely heavily on duplication of genes. 
And then this duplicated and dialogues and duplications, they can freely mutate independently and, and without losing completely their function because they have some level of redundancy in the system. And these mutants uh, start to be combined with other mutants from other species that they kind of engulf and, and they synergize and different species become one. This is a, a very easy to see in eukaryotic cells when you have organelles that their origin is, is traced back to bacteria and archaea. Uh, and then finally with selection and multiple rounds of new mutations, you get to what we have today in eukaryotic actin that is gigantic. So if you want to understand what happened and then how you, you change the biophysical properties of a small prokaryotic cytoskeleton to become an eukaryotic cytoskeleton, first you have to focus in the duplication of genes and see, look for a species and, 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 and different kinds of cells that do have this multiple, you know, uh, upper end redundant cytoskeleton systems. And so that's why my lab is focused completely in Archaea, uh, because Archaea is the closest, um, uh, is the closest prokaryote related to eukaryotes, as you can see in these trees. And because we cannot rescue, or very likely we won't be able to rescue exactly the immediate uh, um, descendants of the prokaryotes that became eukaryotes, because probably they are dead two, uh, for like two billion years already, the best we can do is to study the cell biology experimentally and the evolution of these little guys in the branches of archaea, the closest we can get to eukaryotes and see how the cytoskeletons evolve it. So one of the organisms or the class of organisms I work uh, a lot is Haloarchaea. Uh, Haloarchaea is present in the environment like everywhere in the world. They grow in salt ponds. Um, here is a picture in the left. Uh, it's a picture of, of a salt lake, like in, I, I guess this is in California. And, but you have a, a, a number of them in Utah as well. And in, in, in the middle, you're gonna see a flask in my lab of like Hello Archaea being cultured and see the style crystals being formed spontaneously. And as you might imagine right now, they, you can see like they have this pinkish, you know, uh, color and and that's why when you buy pink salt uh, in the grocery store imagine that it's pink because it has a lot of goodies and uh, it's healthy for you but actually you're just eating dead archaea or the debris of dead archaea and other helophilic uh, microorganisms that are there um, and so the advantage of working with hello archaea is not because they are salty and they grow in high salt, temp, uh, high salt uh, concentrations. It's basically because they are very good lab models. They have like, relatively easy genetics. They grow relatively fast and uh, they do have good genome annotation. So it's great for experimental work. Another thing that I love about them is that very close uh, organisms, evolutionarily speaking, they they have a, a distinct phenotypic traits. So you have rods, rod-like cells, you have plate-like cells, you have squares, you have triangles. So this gives us a lot of questions that we can explore in terms of morphology and function of cytoskeleton to determine this morphology and shape. So the first thing that I'm also interested in archaea is that not surprisingly, they have a number of duplications of cytoskeletal elements. While uh, most bacteria have one FTSZ, meaning one tubulin-like gene, these organisms have multiple superfamilies of genes. So some species will have up to five or six, some of them will have up to 20 uh, gene, uh, duplications or paralogs of different superfamilies of tubulin. Um, here I'm representing only two main superfamilies, the FTSZs and the SETSIs. The FTSZs are more, more like the, the bacterial tubulin. The SETSIs are closer to the eukaryotic tubulin. So my question is, what is the function and how, what I can learn with, uh, uh, what I can learn about the evolution of the cytoskeleton systems by studying their dynamics and function. 
Um, the first thing that we know from literature and the people have been studying already is that we know that after C1 um, uh, filament localized at the center of the cell, just like the prokaryotic, uh, the bacterial FTCZ bacteria. So people are starting to, uh, uh, to, to think then that they might be involved in cell division because they are localized to cytokinetic ring. So the first thing I've done was to explore the dynamics of this FTSZ1 filaments. And su not surprisingly localized to the mid cell. However, the dynamics was quite atypical. At first, the cytokinesis, they follow cytokinesis in an anisotropic way. You can see that they started, start the cell division from one side of the cell and move forward until the opposite side. Um, this, is, this is not seen in bacterial cytokinesis. And, but this is quite common in some animal uh, cytokinetic events. For example, we have xenopopulus like ag, or you have also in, in C. elegans embryos. You have cytokinesis that start at one end and go slicing off um, the entire cell to another end. Interestingly, the, this kind of cytokinesis in animals is quite dependent, dependent on myosin 2, that is a motor protein that is only, or is known, is thought to be only present in eukaryotes. So this is starts to become very interesting. So I have two hypotheses. Or the archaea also have a myosin-like protein that is a motor protein that is generating force that is not present in bacteria. Or the, the, genera or the, the generation of force in an isotropic way emerged before myosin, before my motor proteins. And then motor proteins replaced this mechanism later in evolution. So, to understand a little bit better and inspect further these dynamics and see what, it, what relies on these ensembles of proteins inside the cytokinetic ring, I did a lot of turf experiments, meaning I was imaging basically at the membrane of the cells and looking to individual filaments and single molecules at the membrane. So the first observation was that when I image FTAS Z1 GFP filaments, is that not only they localize, not only they slice off from one side of the end, but in between these events, they are also moving directionally around the circumference of the cell. And, and this is interesting because uh, from my postdoc work in bacteria, uh, uh, sorry, um, this, so, this is interesting. From my postdoc work in bacteria, I also saw the same kind of phenomena of directional motion. Of, of, of bacterial uh, cytoskeleton in live cells. So there are two ways that cytoskeleton can move directionally. They have this directional uh, flow. One is translocation that is quite present in eukaryotic cells. You have a motor protein that binds to, to filaments and then they pull the filaments away. And then I'll ask you to notice like, you know, the green subunit here that is pointed out by the red uh, arrowhead. So you see that in here, the superunits are moving together with the, with the filament. And the second way of them moving, they can move processively is treadmilling, in which it relies on polymerization at one end and depolymerization at the opposite way, uh, end. So in this case, the, 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 the monomatic subunits are not moving directionally together with the filament. So, when we image FTCZ filaments in bacteria, what we see is something like that, pretty similar to the archaeal uh, time lapses. You see the cytokinetic rings and filaments crawl from one side of the cell to the other. Uh, but when we image uh, single molecules of these filaments, you see that they are non moving directional, they're static. So this is the evidence that we use among other experiments to prove that FTC, bacterial FTCZ filaments are actually treadmilling uh, uh, across the cell cycle. So just to see if this is the case for, for archaeal cells, I've done the same thing. While I was imaging FTCZ1 filaments, uh, the assembles of the filaments, I also imaged single molecules of this 
of these polymers. And the same way that the bacterial FSZ, the archaeo FSZ1 single molecules are not moving directionally. They show up, they stay static for a while, and then just, or the flow force bleach out, or the filament or the subunits just leave the polymer and diffuse in the cytoplasm. Uh, there are a number of things that we've been doing with that kind of data right now. Um, uh, we are measuring the residence time of the single molecules together with the velocity of the filaments and trying to infer the length of the filaments uh, in this equation. Right now, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to talk a lot about this because um, what is important that we are focusing more than the measurements and what we do with the measurements and what we do is what is the function of the system. So the first hypothesis is that FTSC1, because it behaves similarly to like the, the, the bacterial FTSC, uh, is that FTSC1 is, is involved in cell division. So in, in bacteria, when we get different bacterial systems and we measure the FTSC velocity and plot against the cytokinesis rate, that is the velocity in which the brain constricts uh, we see that they correlate quite well. And that makes sense because we know that the treadmilling rates in the, of, the, of the polymers are, is important to determine how fast they are constricting. However, when you do the same thing for IKEA and, and correlate after Z1 treadmilling rates and cytokinesis rates, there is no apparent uh, correlation, at least not with a number of four experiments. Uh, that could be true if we just go for 400 different species, but, but for the ones that we have, we cannot see any you know, significant correlation uh, among them. So the first hypothesis that we have is that actually FSC1, even though localized to the cytokinetic, cytokinetic ring, is not involved in cell division. So to start inspecting this, what I've done was to start to deplete each FTSC system. So we have FTSC1 and have FTSC2 uh, filament systems. So independently, we're starting to tune down the lab, the protein levels, and see what happens to cells. So this is a microfluidic uh, experiment. So we are depleting them at the same time together with the control in the left. So what we see here is that as it depletes, normal cells are growing, dividing, growing, divide. However, FTSC2 cells they stop dividing immediately. They just become these big blobs. But differently than Z2 cells, Z1 cells, they, they start to misshape, but they keep on dividing. And later on depletion levels, you see that these poor guys keep trying on really hard to divide, but they just can't at some point. They start to break away. They divide poorly because they start to lose the, their, their morphology, the cell morphology, and losing the special cues that direct the filaments to do what they need to do in the cell. So they are just unregulated. So these experiments point out that these two filament systems have very different functions. Uh, probably Z2 involved in cell division and Z1 um, in, in cell shape determination or cell elongation making sure that the cell expands. So we did a little bit of more quantitation out of this experiment. We did some cell segmentation and from these areas, we plotted uh, the single cell growth rate of them uh, to see independently how the cell, how fast the cells are growing. So for the Z2 uh, depleted cells, we saw that they were growing way faster or at least, or at least like significantly faster than Z1 and the control. That's kind of surprising because making cells growing faster is something very hard in biology. It's not every day that you see an experiment that you actually induce uh, under the same you know, conditions of, of nutrients and temperature and everything, you make a cell growing faster. So the interpretation of this experiment right now that we have is that if Z2 is involved in cell division, and cell division is competing to expand with cell elongation, meaning when you have factors that you need to insert so the cell elongates, while you have to also compete for ingrow of the cell division, when you don't need to, 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 to have the second mode of growth, that is the inward growth, 
you have more factors and you have, you can expand the, the cell envelope faster. So that would explain why Z1 depleted cells are also slightly slower than, than the control. So now you, you are growing very, very slowly because you have less factors. You have less filaments directing the, the growth of the cell envelope. Interestingly, uh, uh, when we measure the point which one cell divides until the point this, the daughter cells divide again, and I call this a cell cycle period, the time that it takes, FTSZ1 cells or cells that don't have FTSZ1, they spend more time to cycle, to start a new cycle and divide and go ahead. Meaning that they need to grow a little bit further and it takes a little bit more time to grow to get to that point and divide and restart the cell cycle again. So right now, so right now we have this hypothesis. However, this species of archaea is quite not so simple to work with. You can see that they are pleomorphic. They assume many different morphologies. Um, so we did the same experiment, or a very, very similar experiment, with a different species of archaea, that is Halobacterium salinarum, that the special thing about this one is that they are always rot. So they have a very specific discrete morphology. So by feeding them into a microfluidic device called the mother machine that consists of these channels in which the cells get in and they grow and they fall off when they reach the, the surface of the, of the chip, uh, we image FSZ1 GFP in the cells, also localized to mid cell. And then we depleted, or in this case, we didn't deplete, in this case, we deleted that completely the, the, the FTS, FTSZ2 gene. And what we saw is that even though cells don't divide anymore, just like in Volcanii cells before, these cells keep growing and maintain the rod-like shape. So that is another evidence that Z2 is not involved in cell elongation or cell growth at all. And we can see the same uh, phenomenon that I observed before that with all Z2 cells uh, are growing even faster. So not only they, don't care about their morphology, don't care. They are actually elongating in a faster way. So when, so this hypothesis brings up like, you know, again, Z1 being responsible for one mode, Z2 for a different mode of, 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 of cell growth. Uh, when we do it again, the, 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 the correlation plot between after Z1 speed, but now correlating with doubling time, that is how much time it takes how long it takes for one cell to grow from one mass to two times the mass of the cell. So at times it takes to double its mass. So we see that there is a complete correlation between Z1 speed, the filament speed, and growth. Uh, Alex, a quick question. Sure. So the, 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 the way you're measuring the filament speed, that is on the assumption that these are individual filaments, right? There's no bundling or any higher order structure which we can't yes. resolve at this point. That's, yes, complete, okay. you're completely right about that, okay. Shashank. Uh, this okay. is a problem, okay. and we see a lot of, of, of noise in our, in our measurements. Uh, so that's why we get a distribution of values. And, and that's why I don't, if I want, we want to model how these filaments uh, like grow and infer like length and all these kind of things, this is gonna be a problem in the future. We have to consider all these aspects. Okay. However, for correlations, hmm. that's kind of true for every each of one of these species. So that's an okay inference to, to, to make from that. Right, I think it makes a lot of openings for in vitro work afterwards, as far as curious. Exactly, that, that's another thing that we're moving on to purify the systems. Uh, and this is gonna be important to see if these are copolymers. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that because maybe these filaments, even though they have different functions, they can copolymerize and, and make one you know, copolymer, or maybe they can laterally associate and make a copolymer laterally. So all this kind of, you know, information or details about the mechanism, molecular mechanism, how they work is unknown. But, but by these experiments, we can pinpoint that they are doing very different things in the cell. Uh, so yeah, so this trend, uh, suggest and again, this trend and this correlation only implies in correlation. It doesn't imply in causation. Right now, what we are doing is creating mutants of this 
different filaments of this GTPase mutant. So we are abolishing the GTPase enzymatic activity to decrease the GTPase activity and decrease treadmilling, slow down filaments, and then see what happens to these correlation plots. So that's what we're trying to prove the causality of this correlation that we're showing here now. So uh, again, we now we have this uh, model and, and that we are proposing that we have different filament thalamus that even though they co-localize, they work in the same region of the cell, the cytokinetic ring, they are not doing the same thing. We have the SC1 working on elongating the cell envelope and then Z2 working on uh, constrict the envelope. And when I talk about envelope and to inspect if this is true, we need to know about more about the envelope. What is the envelope of our keel cells? Uh, so this is a, a, a model that is being published for bacteria that I use just for you to, to realize what I'm proposing here. So this is the archaeal. Imagine that this is the archaeal envelope and then we have this kind of cytokalic cytokal filaments moving around the meat of the cell, and they are directing other enzymes and cofactors, and then remodeling the cell envelope and inserting new material in the envelope as the envelope expands. So I'm going to show again. You can see these little dots moving circumferentially around the division site and expanding the cell. This is quite exciting because uh, this is a mechanism that is quite not usual. Uh, there is very little information about other organisms that do that. There are organisms that expand the envelopes by pole insertion. They, so they are growing from the cell poles. There are others that are growing from everywhere in the cell cylinder. They are all sort of cell elongation mechanisms. This is unheard of, at least like, you know, until now. So what is a cell envelope? So cell envelope differently than bacteria is made of uh, of glycoproteins called the S layer. These S layer proteins, they self-associate at outside of the cell in the outer face of the membrane. They form these symmetrical units, just like origami DNAs, but actually these, uh, these are uh, uh, protein origamis, not DNA. And these like symmetric units or uh, unit cells, they interact with other unit cells and they form this monolayer outside of the cell. And different species have different types of S-layer proteins, of glycoproteins, and they associate in different patterns. And this is believed to be important for different cell morphologies. Um, so to have more, a little bit more detail on the molecular aspect of S-layer insertion, everything starts when the ribosomes, uh, sorry, the RNA polymerases make S layer mRNA. This mRNA is recruited by the sac system and ribosomal proteins in which they will co-translationally secrete the mRNA, meaning there are no S layer proteins inside the cytoplasm. They are gonna be translating them and synthesizing proteins as you secrete them outside of the cell. Then you're gonna glycosylate these S layer proteins. The sortases will chop off part of, uh, of the protein and covalently bind to phospholipid heads. They will self-associate, like I show it in you. And then something that is not known is that if they can be remodeled. And this remodeling might be important because we know that these archaea can, are very, very uh, dynamic in changing shapes. So some of these species, they are not happy only being one shape or another. They sometimes, depending on physiological conditions, they can evolve from plates or discs or rods and vice, and vice versa. They can revert these transitions as well. So my hypothesis is that not only the acid layer and the rearrangement of acid layer is important for this, the cytoskeletons that are regulating the insertion of this acid layer have to be important to, to coordinate these processes. So, Coming back to our hypothesis that you have FTSZ1 responsible for elongation and FTSZ2 responsible for cell division, uh, uh, provided that we know that both of them are at mid cell and we are suggesting that cell is growing from its middle, like it's a mid cell elongation. So acid layer protein and insertion of new acid layer protein has to be at mid cell. So to prove that, what we've done, we use a WGA, that is this lactin protein that binds 
uh, sugar groups, specific sugar groups. So this protein is uh, conjugated with a fluorescent dye. We incubated this, this, this probe with the, with the cells growing, and then we wash it out the, the, the dye. So in this moment, this cell, this is in turf, we are seeing the surface of the cell. Um, and then we wash it the dye, and now we're gonna see the cell growing without the dye and see where the signal is gonna disappear. So what we saw was as the cell grows, the signal disappears preferentially at, from mid-cell. Uh, to corroborate that, we also treated cells with uh, proteases, chewing up all S layer, all the S layer uh, coat outside the cells, and then they wash it out the protease and saw how they would recover their shape. And interestingly, like these blobs would recover shape by making these dumbbells, remodeling the cell uh, from its middle first before it propagates to the cell poles. So all that, um, indirectly uh, points out that S layer, the new S layer proteins are being sorted and remodeled at mid cell. However, we did something more that we tagged S layer itself. So we attach it S layer protein to, to, to GFP. And then what, when we start inducing the S layer fusion, what we saw is that our S layer, the new S layer, newly synthesized, localized to mid cell, where FTSZ1 and FTSZ2 actually is. So more than that, we also tagged the enzymes that are responsible to process S layer outside of the cell. Art A is the sortase that chops off the S layer and combines with the phospholipid uh, phosphoheads. And then the sac Y is part of the complex that secretes the S layer protein outside. And both of them co-localize at mid-cell. This is quite you know, impressive for me. That's not something that I was expecting when I did the experiment. Uh, and that has huge implications. For once, implies that the FTSZ1 filaments likely are regulating the ribosome positions in the cells. So we might have something that is quite typical of eukaryotes, that you have specialized ribocomplexes at mid-cell and, and other ribo complexes spread out elsewhere in the cell. Like, so this, is, this, this kind of, um, this kind of, 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 of sharing of like, you know, duty or, or job sharing is kind of unique of eukaryotes. It's not very well characterizing for eukaryotes. And this is an interesting avenue that we want to understand how different filament systems are organizing and localizing different ribo complexes and why they do that. And I told you before that this is quite unique for our Kia growing from mid-cell and organizing ribocomplexes, but it's actually not. It's quite, it's quite rare, but it's not unique. So for example, this plant here, that is a microbial plant, is a unicellular plant, uh, also synthesizes new cellulose from its middle. And also segregates the chromosomes in a kind of like a unique way. So right now we are trying to make a parallel between the archaeo cellular system that we are using, the size skeleton dynamics with, uh, with, with this kind of microbial plants and see if we can trace a, a parallel between them. So right now, uh, it, there's a long way to go. This is all only in the beginning. We are very interested to, to in, investigate further the dynamics of the cytoskeleton systems and how they regulate different factors that bind to cytoskeleton. Uh, we haven't even started with the more eukaryotic tubulin-like sets. And a question that we have is, how do they interact with each other? And if they all tread meal at the same velocity? So could be that we're gonna see different speeds, could be that you're gonna see they have all the same speed and maybe we have only one motor, only one side skeleton system that determines the velocity, limits the velocity of the, fil of the filaments. And how these filaments, even doing different, uh, performing different functions, can sense one system or another. This is, this is a very interesting way that we're thinking, is that this is a way that you can uh, couple and co-regulate different cell cycle uh, phases. 
if you have to grow and you have to segregate DNA, you have to divide, how do you do this in a cell that doesn't have compartments, that uh, diffusion is very fast and everything's interacting with everything at the same time? That could be, be done by having different filament systems that interact with each other and sense each other's biophysics while, as the cell cycle progresses and that they know when cell division is good to go and start constriction. And, and when it's not, and we just start, you know, in idle mode. So um, this, of course, this is a very specific aim. In general, we are very interested in, from there to start to expand to different species of archaea and see how these tubulin uh, families evolve it to become eukaryotic, meaning both dynamics, function, and, and, and size. So which kind of mutations progressively made them, you know, become larger and become uh, mechanically robust and, 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 and form a perfect scaffold for the eukaryotic cell. I wanted them to thank you all for, 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 for like listening to, 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 to us and our, our results. And the Besson lab that is still small, but everybody's very exciting to be working on these problems and others and our collaborators and uh, inside and outside Brandeis. And I would love to, to answer questions and discuss any part of the talk then. Uh, thanks very much, Alex, that was great. Um, yeah, so uh, we got a lot of people here. Um, you can just jump in and ask a question or if you wanna be a little bit more organized, you can raise your hand and then I'll call your name out. Okay. I'll just jump in to start. Um, so you showed cases in which they were making all these funny shapes. Mm -hmm. uh, is there evidence there that the uh, S-layer proteins are getting inserted at particular places to drive those shape changes? Uh, oh. Yeah, that's also something I was wondering. And can I just um, add another tad to that, which is do you understand, mm -hmm. are there any like variable glycosylation of those S layer proteins or any evidence of that? Yeah, these are very good questions. Uh, I want to believe it because these are things that we're investigating right now. So first one, the, the, where the S layer is being inserted. Yes, right now we are working exactly on, like, on that, like you know, first investigating different morphologies and see where the S layer is being inserted. Uh, um, it, it's, it's kind of a tricky thing because they, it, all of these shapes, they are inserted the same way. However, there are other uh, uh, surface proteins that are not, it's not only one protein, there are other surface proteins there. There are over a dozen of them that we're investigating to see if they, they can exchange different substrates and, 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 and nest layer proteins to make one shape or another. But as far as you could investigate, the position insertion as the cell grows doesn't change. But then the glycosylation is a second hypothesis that is, in, that is interesting because there are two main pathways of glycosylation in archaea. They are all end glycosylation like, like eukaryotic glycosylation. And they do have different enzymes that can insert different sugar groups there. So we are using mutants of these glycosylases, these enzymes insert different uh, glycogroups to see if we can force them to become one shape or another. We do know we have mutants that force them to become our only rods, our only plates, our only triangles. We do have already that. Uh, uh, but we have very little, you know, mechanistic insights of how these factors are doing exactly that. Great. Yeah. I mean, that makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah. Uh, more importantly, I think that uh, we are, we are, it's very more than, we don't know what, we know that the factors are important. We know glycosylation is important. Uh, the thing is that we're trying to couple this information with uh, cytoskeleton dynamics and how the cytoskeletons are, you know, localizing and moving around the cell. So uh, it's, a, it's a more a bottom-top approach in which we want to reach cytoskeleton through the factors that are ultimately enforcing shape. But 
this could be, this understanding will be important to start doing to performing <laughs> performing oh we have we have someone with a question here uh so to me we have we have uh, we have a chance of like understanding better we can mix different acetylated proteins from different species and enforce different artificial shapes into that this is a good step to generate a synthetic cell with different shapes for example out of liposomes sorry that's you're you're expressing the different s proteins within a particular cell and then it changes its shape yeah no, so we don't know if that's going to work right now we are using the information from the self association in vitro of this s layer from different species to try to do in vivo shift of the of morphology uh, so let's say that you have a species that has a particular uh, uh, shape let's say square if we can borrow the S layer from this organism and express in our organism that is not square, can we force them to become square? Uh -huh. So that's the experiment. Mm. Awesome. Uh, Alex, I had a question regarding your, uh, yeah, Shashank, sorry. Uh, so I had a question regarding, so you showed one of these images where you had thetaskeletal structures and there were ribosomes interacting with them or attached to them? Yes. So, right. does it also happen in eukaryotic systems as well? Because so this happens in so this happens in almost all eukaryotes in the ER. In the, uh, hmm. So the ER also have co-translation secretion from ER to the cytoplasm to the lumen. Uh, the ribosomes in the nucleus and in the ER are quite very different from everywhere in the cell. So it's quite specialized. Okay. Okay, thank you. So we are working with this hypothesis that this is a proto, uh, it, it's kind of very early to say that, but we are working with the hypothesis that this molecular complex to be mimetizing a uh, 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 pseudo nucleus in like, you know, in early days. So right. that's a, a, a funky way to try to compartmentalize, you know, information uh, and protein synthesis without membrane uh, uh, borders. Hmm. Thank you. Uh, we have another question from the audience, which is just asking the question about these bacterial cytoskeletal proteins that make filaments. Um, do they also have similar hydrolysis of nucleotides? Um, I guess okay. they yes. don't like or act in like filaments. They are, in all aspects, they are exactly like the eukaryotic counterpart. The, the tubulins have GTPase activity, the actins have ATPase activity, and, and so on. The rates are quite different. So most prokaryotic uh, cytoskeleton are way slower in hydrolyzing nucleotides than the eukaryotic counterpart. Uh, there is a rabbit hole that I don't want to get into that. That is, you know, it's, it, People disagree about all that. It depends on like, you know, how long your filament is. If you can force a microtubule to become a protofilament and be small, would that be like inherently like, you no know, slower or apparently slower? So yes, but the, 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 the observed, you know, rate is way smaller. That's the fact. Interesting. Do you have any uh, feeling for why that? I mean, if you're just gonna speculate, you just don't want to get into it. Well, uh, I, I, I am on the ones that I don't think they are inherently is lower. Uh, they are just, they, they, they are, their self-assembly structures are inherently simpler. Uh, however, we can in vitro mimetize all that, you know, bigger structures, all sort of tubules, sheets, all sort of like in vitro. So you can stimulate GTPase activity and decrease in vitro the way we like. So I don't think that they are inherently, they are, they are designed to be slower, uh, you know, uh, in any way. I think it's just the way we measure GTPase or NTPase activity is biased for these traits and these aspects of the, of the architecture of the polymers. But that, does the uh, enzyme reaction rates I mean, snower needs to actually faster doubling of the 
I mean, bacterial, because like the oh, doubling sorry, time for the eukaryote is like 24 hours, bacteria doubling much faster, right? Is that the reason? Uh, because um, it cannot grow longer for the two, I yes. mean, acting. Yeah, I think, I think that the, for once, like the first point of that is that, yes, they grow much faster. However, they are way smaller. So they do have to produce way less, you know, uh, cofactors and substrates. The second aspect is that, um, and also even if you think about beauty and cell, the surface area, the actual surface area is way smaller. The second point is that the function of this, the mechanism and the function is completely different. The eukaryotic side skeleton, they specialize to do very different stuff from mechanical scaffolding, from transport, uh, transporting cargo across the cell. Uh, bacterial side skeleton don't need to worry about transporting cargo in a way that diffusion does most of, this, of the work. What do they need to do is just direct the cargo in the way that you synthesize things or in an organized way. So if you want to make, for let's say, uh, a wall that will divide two cells, you need to make in a, in a way that will be stable in a concentric range, like until it splits in half. Uh, eukaryotic cells, they just generate force, brute force to divide this two cells with actomyosin most of the times. So, so it's, it's, it's a matter of like, they are using enzymatic activity of the cytoskeleton proteins in a very different way. So it's hard to compare directly just the dimensions or how fast they grow. They do it very differently. Another great answer. Um, if anyone else has a question, um, jump on in. Um, otherwise, we can thank the speaker again for a great job. And um, you know, next week we have another talk from uh, a new faculty member, this time from Miami, Vivek Prakash, who did his postdoc in uh, Manu Prakash lab.